there. In this video we're taking a little bit of a study on is the Terran Empire good? The answer is yes. Well, okay, right, okay, we can do better than that. To determine whether or not the Terran Empire was good, whether it ever did anything good, or whether it was a force for good, <laughs> we've got to look at it a little objectively. I mean, what is an empire? Generally speaking, an empire is going to be when one force or collective of forces exerts its will upon others. Say, the Roman Empire is an example, which may even be the origins of the Terran Empire. They were one people from one area who exerted their will and their culture and their beliefs, their religion, their economy, their everything on other peoples. Now, the Terran Empire is very much like that, except it's also got a good healthy dose of racism involved in it as well. Much like the Romans who believe the Celts, for example, were inferior to them, and barbarians, the Terrans often view other races as barbaric, whereas in truth, just like with the Romans, in many occasions it was the Terrans who were the true barbarians. Now, was the Empire good? You could ask the same thing of the Roman Empire. Was the Roman Empire good? It had lasting effects that were positive, but it also had just as many negative. And to look at that, you can apply the same logic to the Terran Empire. Now, in some ways, let's, let's list off some of the, the more positive attributes of the Terran Empire. The Terrans were a more unified people than the peoples of Earth of the Prime Universe. When Vulcan first contact happened on Earth in the Mirror Universe, as far as we can tell, the Terran Empire certainly already existed. Whether or not it actually dominated the entire world, or a good portion of it is unknown. But it certainly existed, and Earth seemed to be a much more unified place. At least, in theory. It certainly became increasingly unified after First Contact. So the Terran Empire was a unifying force for the human race. It gave them something to collectively focus on and collectively believe in. Also a place for them to release their pent-up aggressive energies that they'd spent millennia targeting at one another. But the other side of that coin is everybody else had to feel the wrath of the Terrans. The Vulcans being the first ones, followed by likely the Denobulans, the Andorians and everyone else <coughs> near to them. Excuse me. Now, other things the Terran Empire did that could be considered positive. Now, if you actually look at the irony of it, in the mid-22nd century, during the time of the Rebellion, when the Terran Empire was facing off against a combined force of vessels and force military assets from the conquered races, such as the Vulcans, whom it's interesting that the Terrans had even allowed them to maintain any kind of military in the first place, which implies the Terran Empire ruled less directly and more indirectly, a little bit like the Dominion, with a carrot and a stick philosophy, Starfleet being the stick, whereas possibly the economic benefits of the Empire outweighed perhaps some of the personal liberties that were infringed upon, certainly for some races. If you were Kelpian, for example, things for you were not good, but perhaps things for an Andorian were a little better. That notwithstanding. The great irony was, when you look at the ISS Avenger and the ISS Enterprise, much of the crew of these vessels were made up of Vulcans, Denobulans, Orions, Andorians. But if you look at its Prime Universe counterpart, yes, there was a Vulcan aboard, but not voluntarily. They had to take a Vulcan by force. They didn't have Subcommander to Paul on board because they wanted her, but because she was forced upon them. Ironically, this means that Terran Starfleet was a much more diverse place than that of the Prime Universe. So there's an inclusivity element that we're kind of missing. Now there has to be more to it. The, the Terran Empire cannot simply have been this barbaric, simplistic, two-dimensional, warlike state that they're often portrayed to be. There has to have been more subtlety and more complexity to their rule. When you skip forward to the mid 23rd, well, early to mid 23rd century, once again, you see a much more objectively organized Terran Empire. But, probably as a result of the rebellion that had taken place hundred years earlier, Starfleet does seem to be populated by fewer non Terrans around this time. And certainly, again, by the age era of Kirk, there were again fewer non Terrans. But, a non-Terran in the form of Spock, although he was half-Terran, 
was able to ascend to the throne of Emperor, which, considering he was a half-breed in a society that was very racist, it's saying something. Again, we're missing a component of the Terran Empire, something about their embracing of other cultures as much as their control over them. There has to have been more to it. They have to have sometimes absorbed the power rather than simply conquered it. But without further evidence, it's hard to really elaborate on. Other elements of the Terran Empire that can't be overlooked were technological progression. Now certainly the Terrans focused more of their attention on weapons and military tactical development, but there was certainly development in other areas spearheaded. As you know, when you develop something for the military, it tends to progress other areas of science and technology. Combine that with them leapfrogging, probably by a hundred years, with the introduction of the USS Defiant into their ranks in the mid-22nd century, this would have allowed the Terrans to rapidly evolve technologically far beyond their Prime Universe counterparts in various areas, which would explain why some of their ships were so much more powerful, like the Sharon. That ship was formidable. I know it was using certain technologies that were not commonplace or not exploited at all in the Prime Universe, but then you got to analyze that. If they're exploiting the mycelial technology like that, what else were they exploiting? Were they exploiting black holes as a weapon? Had they developed other forms of weapons technology that humans weren't using. It doesn't, it really doesn't make sense that their ships, for example, would simply look like Starfleet vessels all the time. The Sharon makes a lot of sense that there would be vessels that would break that mold, that they would be built much more for war. We know that the same people don't quite exist in both universes. There's enough difference that certain individuals don't. It's just a lot of the key players that do. These differences would all mount up. Terrans are much more militaristic. They wouldn't, they, they wouldn't have abandoned the concept of overwhelming force or mutual assured destruction or tactics like that, like Starfleet of the Prime Universe had, which would strongly imply they would fully exploit these technologies. In non-canon sources, the Terrans would use the M5 computer system, even though it was incredibly unstable and dangerous. They would mass produce it. Eventually, they would see folly from this, but they did it. Same as they would exploit the mycelial technology, which they shouldn't have done, as they saw again folly from the use of this technology en masse. But the Terran Empire as a whole was a unifying force. The galaxy was oppressed and violent, but it was ordered. The Klingon Empire, which had always been a rogue element within the Quadrant, didn't exist, not in its state that it did in the Prime Universe. The Romulans were not, never seemed to ascend to the power that they were, again, in the Prime Universe. There's very little mention of them, but considering the strength of the other powers and how the Romulans rarely are mentioned, it's likely they simply never ascended to the kind of power that we see them utilize and wield in the Prime Universe. There are other elements that indicate that the Terran Empire, at least similar to the Dominion, whatever its faults, and it certainly had many, it was likely a stabilizing force in the Quadrant. The moment it fell, when it fell apart, you saw the rise of the Alliance, which sounds nicer. It's an alliance, not an empire. But the Alliance was an empire in everything but name, with the Klingons pretty much at its head. And the Klingons of the Prime Universe were an honourable and decent people, generally. But the Klingons of the Mirror Universe were dishonourable and prone to infighting and were much more like Norsicans. They were more like pirates and mercenaries and terrorists than they were a coherently organized, honorable power, at least with its own sense of honor. The Klingons were only of the Prime Universe were not interested in victory at all costs, whereas at the Mirror Universe Klingons, they'd stab you in the back just as in the front. As long as they won and they lived, they were happy with it. Now, the rise of the Alliance saw much more anarchy, chaos, and technological stagnation. Technology didn't advance under the Alliance the same way it did under the Empire living conditions amongst many of the races of the Alliance was far worse than what it had been under the Terrans. The Terrans ruled a lot of the time by proxy. They didn't have the numbers or the real might to truly rule every power that they controlled. They might use, say, for example, the Andorians, or good, actually a good example. They would control Andor and use the Andorian Imperial Guard and forces as auxiliaries in their wars. But they would also grant them greater power and autonomy, meaning the Terrans only had to really maintain a 
military force, a relatively light military force, in Andorian territory, but then the Andorian military would be used as cannon fodder to soften up enemies and also to exploit and control other powers near to their border, meaning that the Andorians did a lot of the heavy lifting and the Terrans controlled them, and they used the Andorians to control ten other races. As an example, apply this philosophy across an area of space that's, that is larger than the Federation. The Federation had over 200 member races by its height in the 24th century. In the 23rd century, the Terran Empire was likely already larger than that. So, was it a force for good? No. But it did have positive attributes. It advanced technology. It increased cohesion. It increased unity. It made races that would normally have been enemies and would likely have destroyed one another because the universe in general was a more violent place. It gave them something to rally against, and it helped in the creation of a federation. And although that federation did not last, if it wasn't for the Terran Empire, that federation never would have existed. And there's a chance that after the fall of the Alliance at the hand of the Terran rebels in the 24th century, that is what would happen again. Certainly Terran aggression and their general nature and disposition hadn't changed too much, but they learned a little humility at the hands of the Alliance. That was pretty obvious with people like O'Brien. Certainly he was a warlike individual, he was a soldier, but he was no barbarian. He was no savage. And... I don't know. I think the Terran Empire did have positive attributes. But I think the negatives likely outweighed the good, but the long-term effects could have been more positive, which is something Spock could have seen when convinced that the Empire was destined to fall anyway, and the rise of something better in its wake could have come. You see parallels throughout history, but at the same time, another parallel was the fall of the Roman Empire saw the Dark Ages. And what I think we're seeing in the 24th century is the Dark Ages, again, amongst many races. Yes, they're still advanced, yes, they're still spacefaring, but liberty, knowledge, freedom, all these things are restricted far beyond what they were during the days of the Terran Empire. So was the Terran Empire good? No. Did it have good aspects? Yes, it did. It actually did some positive. Is it worth it? That's debatable because we don't really know what the galaxy would have been like without them. Probably not. But at the same time, yes. Because it's better if you're going to have the barbarism and the violence, it's better that there be light at the end of the tunnel than just infinite darkness. And perhaps, as the Klingons demonstrate in that universe, a Klingon-led Alpha Quadrant was worse than a Terran-led Alpha Quadrant. But at least at the end of the Terran Empire, a federation or some form of commonwealth was possible. As we know, there was a great alliance that formed, at least in Beta Canon sources, in the wake of the rebellion. A, a sort of pseudo-federation. Didn't call itself a federation, but there was a fed federation of sorts. Which mirrored a lot of the themes of the United Federation of Planets. So it led to something greater than itself. But unfortunately, people had to endure centuries of bloodshed, violence, conquest, cannibalism, murder, and oppression in order to get there. Plus a hundred years, nearly, of darkness at the hands of the klingon Cardassian Alliance. Those are just my thoughts on this. I'd like to hear other people's. Please comment below. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And again, like I said, start a discussion. I want to hear hear your comments. I want to hear what you think. Was the Terran Empire good? Was it bad? Am I just completely wrong, or am I just a fanboy because I really like the Terran Empire? Either way. Thanks for watching. If you made it all through the video, you're a beautiful human being. And bye-bye.